Genesis chapter 28 as we continue on in this great and amazing book that is changing all of our lives. Amen to that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It says here, chapter 28, verse 1. So Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Lord, tonight we come here and we hand this chapter up into your hands and say, Lord, begin now to speak to us. Lord, I pray for that to happen, that I, all of us in this area right now, we will decrease, Lord, and you will increase in us, intensify our hearing and our understanding through your Holy Spirit. Father, those who are seeking, those who are questioning, those who are doubting, Lord, I pray tonight you would reveal to them your presence. Lord, I pray that nothing would become a distraction that they would hear from you. Lord, those of us tonight who are your children, Lord, shape us, mold us, Lord, pull us into a deeper understanding and thus a deeper love of you and understanding even more the love you have for us, a love that so gave your only son for us on a cross. And so, Lord, I pray tonight your spirit to come upon us in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Now, it says here, so Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him, you shall not take a wife from the daughters. Now, first thing we want to look at is it says so. So you want to notice that word there, so, whether you want to circle it or highlight it or underline it, it says so because it's what? It's conjunction. It's adding on to what happened in the chapter before. Chapter 27, verse 46 is where we're picking up from. But let me have your attention this way. What happened last week in chapter 27? Recall? We got brothers stealing things, don't we? Not just stealing pens here. They're not just stealing lights. They're stealing the blessing. And so we have Jacob who rips off his brother Esau. We have his mom helping him in this deception. We've got one messed up family doing a whole lot of messed up things. And the title of the message was, anyone recall? The dangers of playing church. The dangers of playing church. Here we have Abraham and all that God had spoken to him in his relationship. But we learned, and we've learned many times, that God has no grandchildren. He does not have any grandchildren. God only has children. Do you have a personal relationship? Is your faith strengthened because of your walk, your time in the Word, or is it because your parents and your family and your situation and because you're associated with One Love or New Hope or a church somewhere and so you feel that because I go there, I am. Listen, going to a church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. Or any more than going to get donuts makes you a cop. Okay, it doesn't. Mm Mm-mm. There isn't a direct association that's there. We need to understand our own walks with the Lord. And so what happens here is we see it says, So Isaac called Jacob. Why did he call him in? Well, let's look back at verse 46. Remember, at the end of all the deception, Esau finds out that his brother Jacob has ripped him off and he's mad. He is mad and he's ready to kill his brother. So mom hears this and she comes up with a scheme to get her husband to send the the son away so the one son doesn't kill the other son. And it says, And Rebekah said to Isaac, I am tired of living because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob takes a wife from the daughters of Heth like these, from the daughters of the land, what good will my life be to me? You know, just drama, 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 drama. Stop it already. All this deception, all this stuff. and oh. So with all of this going on, it says, so Isaac called Jacob. Why? Because of the deception. I want you to jot down on the notes. We're not here Walk in Pono just yet with God. But it says this, and he blessed him. Please note this now. He calls him, but now he blesses him. And what I want you to put in your notes, if you're taking notes, as he was supposed to in the first place. Remember, God told him when they were babies. It's 75 years later. Actually, 77 years later, as we learned last week, and went, whoa. So 77 years ago, in the womb, it was said that the younger that the older is going to serve the younger. He knew what he was supposed to do because of his favoritism, because of his preference. And as we said, I know what God says, but I also know how I feel. Oh, how we recognize how dangerous that is and how too much we identify. So often we recognize, God, I know what your word says, da 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 but it just feels right. But I just don't feel like doing that right now. I know what it says, but I know how I feel. And so with that, he seeks to bless the wrong one. Now recognizing that God's hand is large and he now comes and he begins to bless. And so he blessed him as he was supposed in the first way. And then the next part, the third part of this verse, it says, so you shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Why? This goes all the way back to the plan. We now are getting back on track with the plan. Remember, himself, his wife did not come from the area. His father Abraham sent Eliezer back to the... Why? 
Because God said, out of your seed, out of your line, will come forth those who will be a blessing to the rest of the world. Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. And in you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And in your seed, we have this promise of the line, the seed, that we recognize through history, as we saw even last week. Satan has tried to pollute, and he's tried to even breed out the very ethnicity of the Hebrew people because God has said, my Messiah will come and in the last days they will also be key players. And so for that reason, they to this day are still on the radar of the world and those seek their destruction. Are you with me? So here we see now, understanding here, he says, you shall not take away from the daughters of Canaan. He was supposed to keep the family line pure. And what is Canaan? If you got room, Canaan, remember, always represents compromise, the pagan ideals and the pagan gods. We're not supposed to pluralize. We're not supposed to partner, church, with the things that are impure. Impurity and purity cannot meet together. Amen? I hope you are really getting that because we somehow seem to think that we can. We somehow seem to think that we can ignore what God says, God's warning, and somehow my pureness will overpower the impureness. Now, if I had opportunity to do that, I, I couldn't hear tonight because of the visibility where you're at. But when I'm doing this in like a youth group room, I'll have a big clear jar and i'll put one or two drops of food coloring in it and guess what happens to the, the, the pure jar of water what happens it colors the whole thing two or three drops and yet we're sitting there going oh it won't affect me i can handle i like the music i just ignore the lyrics <laughs> and the floating pieces of paper i hand that to you there is this making sense and so we're recognizing here that he says, listen, compromise kills and any amount of it is deadly. And so we recognize what we're supposed to do here. It says, so Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and said, listen, you need to go. But now notice something here. Verse two, it says, arise, go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father. And from there, take to yourself a wife from the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. Now, let's just recall what I just said. Remember, this is Isaac. Abraham, Isaac's father, recall, sent Eliezer, his servant, to find him a bride. And now here we have Isaac sending his son Jacob to find his own bride. Folks, you see, that's what happens when you live in the flesh. When you live in the flesh, the consequences of the flesh, the dependency of the flesh falls upon you. You see, here is the dangers of playing church. You see, Abraham, knowing that God will provide and the paracletus, how the Holy Spirit will provide for me, he will bring for me that which I need. He sends his servant and says, trust in the Lord and the Lord will bring that right one back. And Eliezer says, oh Lord, have the one who's going to be the one. Say, she'll feed my camels and she'll do all these things. And so he leads it up to the Lord and the Lord does a miracle and he comes down and he falls down on his knees and praises her. Remember that? Oh, what a joy it is to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word. I sang that once. To trust in the Lord. Here's, here's what Abraham was able to do. But now in the flesh, Isaac is saying, you know what? You got to go and get your own. See, when we're not trusting in the Spirit, we're not walking in the Spirit, we feel we need to lean on our own understanding. And so now, so many of us in this very room tonight have been working harder than we need to because God says, you've been doing it. I'll do it if you'll just ask, trust, and obey. Amen? Amen. We need to get this into our heads. We need to understand this distinction here. Here in just one generation, watching the Lord work for us and now having to do it on our own. And oh, the headaches that we're going to get into as we see this guy doing it on his own. Now, verse 3 goes on to say this. Isaac is still blessing his son Jacob. He's saying, and may God Almighty, would you underline that? I'll tell you in a moment. And may God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you that you may become a company of peoples. May he also give you the blessing of Abraham to you and to your descendants with you, that you may possess the land of your sojournings, which God gave to Abraham. Then Isaac sent Jacob away, and he went to Badam Aram, to Laban, son of Bethuel the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob and Esau. Now, Here's the thing we first need to ask ourselves. How can Isaac be giving such a blessing? He says, may the God Almighty bless you and be fruitful and multiply you. May he give you the blessings of Abraham with your sentence. How can he be saying all this stuff after he just been deceived by the son? He just been ripped off. He puts on the camel's hair. He puts the food. He does all an entire act of deception. How can this father be giving him a blessing? Well, folks, 
The blessing that we see is because of the prophecy that was given in chapter 25, meaning it was God's plan all along. God chose Jacob. Hear me, church. God chose Jacob not because of Jacob's worth, but because of God's grace. Amen? You see, how could he get a blessing when his actions, he was such a scoundrel? The same way you and I do, and that is by God's grace. I can say, Lord Jesus, forgive me. Bring your blessing upon me, Lord God. And the Lord says, I desire to have plans for you to prosper you, not to harm you. We hear that, we sing that, we repeat that, and yet we go around beating ourselves saying, I am not worthy. You're right, you're not worthy, but you're called, so shut up and enjoy. Begin to enjoy the blessings of a daddy who wants to spoil. Does anyone out there want this? It's a little quiet out there. You have not because you... So you're saying, uh, whoo, blessings. Blessings. You see, it's God's grace. And the same is true for us. That word El Shaddai is the word God Almighty. Remember I taught you what El Shaddai means. El Shaddai comes from the literal word which provide from the breast where the breast would supply the milk for the child. Remember, they did not have infamil. It was from the mother. And so the very provision of what a mother would provide for a son is the word that God uses to describe himself. El Shaddai, God Almighty, the supplier of your needs. Amen. God is the supplier of our needs. Now, I wish I could just say that a hundred times and say, let's close in prayer. But I don't think you'd still get it. I know I struggle with it. God will richly supply, the Bible says, all our needs. Richly supply. So why are we stressing? Why are we looking elsewhere? God is at work, dear ones. God is at work. And if we live, we die. God is at work. If we are sick or we are well, God is at work. God's grace is more than sufficient. God's love is here. Now, notice verse 6. It says this. Now, Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob. So now here's his brother. He's just having a bad one, isn't he? He's getting everything ripped off. And now that everything is even getting ripped off, then he looks and sees he wants to kill his brother. And what did his parents do? Scold the other brother? No, they bless him. I don't know. You can ask my brother Mark how he thinks that would feel. Now, moving on. <laughs> now Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Benam Aram to take to himself a wife from there. And that when he blessed him, he charged him saying, you shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Now listen, verse 7. And that Jacob had obeyed. Would you underline that? Here's the beginning of things beginning to change here. That Jacob had obeyed. The key word, the key ingredient to blessings is standing right under that spout where his blessing comes out. Obedience. We're going to look at that a lot in the next several chapters ahead. But Jacob obeyed his father and his mother and had gone to Padam Aram. So Esau, please note now, so Esau saw that the daughters of Canaan displeased his father and mother. Now, remember, he already has two wives from this area. Are you with me? So remember, he's already taken two wives from this area. Now he sees that his dad says to his younger brother, hey, don't take a wife from here. Don't take a wife from the land of Canaan. Go back to Padam Aram and take a wife from the, from the family, from the father's family. Now it says this, so Esau saw that the daughters of Canaan displeased his father Isaac. And Esau went to Ishmael and married, besides the wives that he had, Mahalath, the daughter of, again, underline Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebaeth. Folks, hear the irony in this. Trying to please his father, the unchosen son of Isaac, marries into the unchosen line of Ishmael. Think about it here. The unchosen one, trying to please his father. You see, Esau, folks, still doesn't get it. He doesn't understand God's perfect plan. He doesn't understand the Abrahamic covenant and its purity when God has his word, his will, and his way. And so, hey, you don't want one of these daughters? Okay, well then, I'll get one that's not from here. I'll go to Ishmael. But that's not, we have God's chosen. Look at me for a second, please, everyone. There is a chosen plan and blessing for you. I believe that with all my heart. God's word is clear about it. There is a blessing for you. There is a plan. You got God's perfect will and God's permissive will. 
His perfect will is this blessing that he wants. But guess what? He lets you choose whether or not you're going to stand there and get filled up or whether you're going to do, like I said last week, just <laughs> Sunday morning, Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Wednesday night, quiet time, conference, weekend, men's retreat, okay. <laughs> All the guys are coming back. Wow, that was so great. Why? Because you took time to be still and know that he was God. Amen. To refresh, hang out with one another. Encourage one another, fellowship, all the things, the key ingredients that you see in the book of Acts that caused the early church to grow. Breaking bread, studying the word, fellowship and prayer. That's what we did and that's why we're blessed. Folks, the point is this. He is still seeking blessings if you're taking notes. Esau is still seeking blessings on the human level. That is so important tonight because some of us in this very area tonight, hearing my words, are doing just that. You believed in a God that saved you by grace, but you're still living under an understanding that somehow God is blessed with you by works. You continue to use the word more in your sentences. If I just read more, if I pray more, if I just got up a little earlier, if I served. Folks, serving the Lord. We have to understand something here. We have a messed up idea of what it means to serve God. Hear me clearly. A benefactor. If you go to a building and it's the John Smith. Well, we got the John Burns building down here. The benefactor and the beneficiary. We have to get those clear. You see, the benefactor is the one who gave the money. The benefactor is the one who provided for it. And then the beneficiaries are those who are blessed by it. When we say we're serving the Lord, there is a part within us that seems to think that we are serving the Lord and that the Lord needs our help and that He is the beneficiary of our work. Dear ones, the Lord God is the benefactor. We are His kids. We are His workmanship created for good things in Christ. Amen? And so the Lord is God. He is God. There is nothing that I can do to affect that. He is love. He is large and in charge. He is God. And so the beneficiary, when I serve the Lord, it tells me in the Bible, Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, do you work heartily as unto the Lord. He says, whatever you've done to the least of my brethren, you do it unto me. Unto me. Am I making sense? Amen. So it's when we're serving, when we're getting out, when we're getting away from this human mindset, this human understanding that I can do something to earn God's favor. No, the benefactor, Lord God Almighty, already is loving you and I tonight unconditionally. There's nothing you can do to make Him love you more. There's nothing you can do to make Him love you less. Isn't that great? Now, don't abuse it. Don't abuse that truth and have sloppy agape. And go, well, He's going to forgive me. Yes, He will forgive you, but you will carry the scars. I counsel with people every single week battling this scar. I say tonight we obey and avoid the scars altogether. Amen? You see, here's Esau trying to do something in the flesh. And what does he do? He just compounds his own rebellion and adds on a third wife in polygamy. Which, by the way, a lot of times people say, when was polygamy wrong? When did it become wrong? I look him right back in the eye and say, when was it right? In the garden, and it was Adam and Eve, not Adam and Eve and Susan. <laughs> Adam and Eve. You see, listen, the Bible records. When a newspaper records and then says two people were shot in Wyana or shot someplace, they're not agreeing with it. They're not saying, you know, endorsing it. They're recording it. The Bible records all the bamboozles that these guys did. So we would go, thank you, Jesus. You can love me too. Amen? And so here we see him getting into this deeper pit because he's still in the flesh trying to get approval from somebody, from his parents, from God. Some of you are there tonight. You've been seeking so hard the approval of a man, whether it be a physical man, whether it be a coach, whether it be someone to say you're pretty, to say you're wonderful, to, that your work is worthy, whatever it is. And folks, tonight I'm telling you, you're striving for something like Esau that you don't need to do. Look up because your Redeemer is nigh. He's right here. And he wants to bless you. Verse 10. Then Jacob departed from Beersheba and went towards Haran. Two things you need to know. Esau is now trying to kill him. His mom hears it and says, Son, you got to get out of Dodge. So he sends him. The point is this, that because his brother's trying to kill him, Jacob is running for his life. Now, if you look at a map where Beersheba is and where Padam Haran is, maybe you can look up here for me and I can show you. Here's Beersheba, here's Padam Haram, and he's actually going this way. 
We're going to see Bethel is up here. And so he's going this way. Rather than going the direct route, he's going this way. Why? I think he's trying to pull a couple of full sneaking maneuvers to make sure he's not being followed by someone his brother hires. He wants to save his life. He is in panic mode. Are you with me? Okay, why is that important to say tonight? That is this. Are you running tonight? You see, you're either walking in the direction of God's will or not. And sometimes we're not only not in the direction of God's will, but we're running. Because like Jonah, the Lord said, this is what I want you to do. And you're like, that's okay. I don't feel called. I don't think I'm capable. Whatever it may be. You see, when you're running, you're dodging. And when you're dodging, you're not on the right path. And God wants you tonight, tonight, to be recorrected, get your holy GPS on fire, and get back on the path. Amen. And that's what he wants to do. Jacob's running. Are you running? Now verse 11, it says this. And he came to a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had sent. And he took one of the stones of the place and put it under his head and lay it down in that place. Now, he took one of the stones. Those of you that went to Israel with me, where did he get one of those stones? Again, though, this is one rocky country. Everywhere you look, every two feet, it is filled with rocks and stones. So here he comes to this certain place, and it's time to shut down. It's time to take a little sleep. And so he has to clear the rocks out of the air. Now he's clearing the rocks and making for himself a little soft area where he can actually sleep. He takes one of the rocks, and he sits it up and uses it for a pillow. First point that I want you to take. Not exactly mommy's palace, is it? Remember, this is mommy's boy. He was the inside one. Mama even made the meal for him. You see, thinking he be, was going to be wise, he's now become a fool, he's on the run, and he's no longer under the comforts that God had originally desired for him. Folks, you may be in Hawaii and you came here because you thought the weather was better, but if it's not where God wants you to be, you're on the run, and you're going to be one miserable puppy. I've seen it my whole life. Can I just have one big group counseling right now and tell you this? The only thing we got here in Hawaii is best weather. But we're not any closer to paradise than any other place in obedience to God. There's no paradise on this side of paradise. So, yes, we got coconut trees, but even man has to go up there and get the coconuts out so they won't land on your head. Now, okay. <laughs> There's a phrase, some of you have heard it. A clear conscience, I want to make sure I say it right. A clear conscience makes a soft pillow. Have you heard that before? A clear conscience makes a soft pillow. So isn't it rather apropos that he's using a rock? He's using a rock because if there's anybody out here right now that does not have a clear conscience, it's Jacob. All the things that have gone on. And so here he finds himself using a pillar of rocks. And then it says this, after he sets up this rock for a pillow, completely out of the comfort zone that God had prepared for him, that he had had in his own home place. It says now in verse 12, and he had a dream. How he fell asleep with this rock, I don't know, but he did. He must have been very, very tired, running for his life. Now, and he had a dream. And behold, a ladder was set on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending upon it. Let's stop right there. Look at me for a second. I have had some imbecile professors in my life. And these guys are just, they just rile my blood. And I had one say to me, so you believe in the Bible? Yes. You believe in the literal Bible? Yes. So you really believe that there was a ladder that went from earth all the way to heaven? That's impossible. And I said, of course it is. He goes, but it's in your Bible. And I said, and also said, it's in a dream. <laughs> in my dreams, I'm fabulous. <laughs> it's a dream. <laughs> I said, oh. It was a 25 footer in my dream. It was two foot in reality. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so he has this dream. Verse 13, and behold, the Lord stood on this bridge. Here we have this, this ladder going from heaven to earth. And the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie. Now, would you circle that word lie? Because I think it has a twofold purpose there, doesn't it? The land on which you lie. I will give it to you and to your descendants. What? <laughs> Wait, this is a guy running. He's on the lamb. He's in rebellion. He is, he's doing all kinds of things wrong. And here comes God upon him in this vision. Why would God do this? Because God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Amen. Amen. 
that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Are we getting a picture tonight, as I talked about on last Sunday and the Sunday before, excuse me, about the grace and the graciousness of God. Here he is on the lamb, running from being a scoundrel, and God shows him a ladder, and God says, I am the God of your father, of your grandfather, and I'm here now to tell you that I will bless you, and I will give this land, I'm going to give it to you. Now, what is this ladder? Jot this down. This ladder is, it's like a bridge. Why? Why would he give him such a vision? Well, it's pretty clear to know by now if you just understand simple psychology psychology and simple ascertaining of the things that are going on here. Here is a man who is now running from his life. He's no longer with his mommy. He's no longer with his daddy. He's no longer in the village where all the servants knew who he was as the kid, the favorite son of a very wealthy family. He's out in the middle of nowhere sleeping on a rock. I have a feeling that this young man at this point in time is struggling with some feelings, some feelings of alienation. Some feelings of condemnation. What did I do? Why did I listen to mom? You know, right away, I, you know, I was thinking about whether I get caught. I didn't. Now I have no one. I'm out here by myself. What if I even get there and, and, and Uncle Laban guys won't accept me? I'm all alone in this world. Nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. I'm going to eat some worms. That's where he's at. He's feeling exiled and alone. Here's the thing. The point of this image, guys, is this, is that God was saying, Jacob, I am present with you and I will be with you wherever you go. There is no place that you are are at that I cannot build a bridge by my son, Jesus Christ. By grace, by my love, there is no place that my ladder can't reach. Amen. That is so good to know. No matter where you went, I am available. I will be there. You see, the thing that you need to write down in your notes is this. Everything, everything God does is solely, completely, totally by grace. Everything that God does is solely, completely, and totally by grace. That is by grace we have been saved through faith. That is why it says, tis grace to trust Him more. Lord, I need your grace just to even to trust you. Oh, the power of the grace and the graciousness of God. You see, one thing we need to note on this, it's very interesting. Look, if you would, in this letter, on this verse 12, and look at this ladder. He had a dream, and behold, a ladder was set on the earth with its top reaching heaven, and behold, the angels were, and what's the very first word it says in your Bible? Ascending and descending. The very first word is what? Ascending. Ascending. Now, all you educated folks, what does that mean? Going Going up. Going up. Now, here's something fun for you. Just a little novel thought. When Jesus repeats this story in John, which we're going to see real soon, when Jesus repeats this story, he himself gives the detail of the ladder stretching from heaven to earth and the angels first ascending and descending. What is this story telling us? The story is suggesting to us that there are angels amongst us and the angels dwell here. That is why it says in Hebrews that many of us have entertained angels without even knowing it. That is why we have a ministry in this church called Entertaining Angels, where we go out on the streets and we meet with folks who are living on the street and homeless. We are showing love because we never know when we're ministering in Jesus' name, we might be ministering to Jesus. We might just be ministering to one of His angels. And I thoroughly believe with all of my heart that there are angels here even tonight amongst us. Now some seen, some not seen. But there are angels here. And some of you are saying, heck yeah, I saw her when she walked in, man. Whew. I love coming to church, man. Okay, listen. It's not what I'm talking about. God and His people are amongst us and at work. Amen? Amen. Come on, you guys, you got to feel. You got to begin to feel the peace about this. You got to understand the presence of this. I know I haven't told this story in a while. Some of you have heard it before, but let me refresh this read. This is a true story. Francis told me this. There was a gal in his church. There was a gal in his church that worked late at the hotels in Waikiki. And she got off late and she was walking and she knows she should have stayed on the main roads. But as you know, in Wikes, there's all these different alleys that go back and she just is tired. I'm going to take this two block alley to get to where I live on the other side of the alleyway. And so she starts going through the alleys. And as she's going through the alleys, she sees a guy approaching. And this guy is walking and he's got the green army coat with the hood on top. Come on, this is Hawaii. Why do you have an army coat on and why is the hood over? And so he's walking and she sees him and she grabs her purse, pulls it in front of her and starts to pray. 
and says, oh, Jesus, help me, Jesus, please, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, I'm so scared, Jesus. Forgive me, Jesus. I should have done the right thing. I should have stayed on the road, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. And as she's walking, this big guy all of a sudden just veers to this side of the alley, completely looks towards the wall and walks past her. And she's oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. She hurries up, gets back in the main road and gets home. She's home, turning on the 10 o'clock news, watching it as she's making dinner, all of a sudden breaking story. A woman mugged and attacked by a man in Waikiki. She looks up on the news. It's this guy. Now stick with me here, church. What I'm talking about is everyday life reality. She is so moved by this, so overwhelmed by this, that she finally calls the pastor, talks, and they pray. She goes down to the, to the jail, asks to have a scene, comes in, he's behind the glass. She looks at him, he looks at her, and he says, she says to him, do you remember me? And he says, yes. He says, why did you attack that other woman and not me? He looks at her like she is completely nuts. Like, she goes, no, seriously, I want to know, why didn't you attack me? He looks her straight in the eye. He says, because that guy on your left and the guy on your right were the two biggest guys I've ever seen in my life. Now, you never knew Gabriel and Michael were Moose and Rocco. You never knew that, did you? (laughs) But folks, we live with a God who is large and... And you know what? I can tell you story after story after story tonight. I won't. We don't have the time. But I got to tell you one more. I was at a missions conference. This rocked. Missionary had to go into town. I don't remember the exact area in Africa. But it was one of the smaller villages in Africa and had to go into the main one like Kenya. Had to buy all this medical supplies. He buys all this medical supplies. Ooh, the black market loves that stuff. This missionary is by himself. He could not get anyone else to go with him. And so he buys all these supplies, drives as far as he can. Uh, the full day he, where he lived it was about three days away. He drives an entire day, goes through the night as much as he can. He's exhausted. He sets up a tent that he has there and he puts everything inside the tent. And then he goes to sleep. There's these gorillas that were watching him and said, this will be great for us to get some money. And so they follow him all the way through and they see where he's going. And so they give him a chance to get ahead. And as they come upon his camp, they come up and there are 36 armed guards standing around this guy's tent with guns. They're like, 36? Where did he get these guys? And they're like, counting what they got. There's no way we can't take them. So they never, never do. Well, comes to find out this missionary and has no clue on that this took place. Throughout the time he's there in Africa, he begins to serve. One of those gorillas who came, his own child was sick, seeks out the missionary. The missionary brings the medical aid out of guilt. He shares with him the story that happened. He's like, there was nobody with me that night. I was completely alone. I have no idea where these guys are. He comes home on furlough, shares this story with his home church. Pastor says, what time was that? Tells him exactly when it was where it was, they begin, he says, gentlemen, that was when we had our men's prayer gathering that day. Stand up if you were there. You want to guess at how many guys were there? 36. That were praying for him that day. Yeah, you're getting Jesus bumps. (laughs) Folks, God is good. Amen. I fear not man. I got angels that kick booty. And so if God wants us to do something, let's do it because he goes before us in his rear, our rear guard. These are not just verses. This is the life that we can live and walk in a love and a strength and a might as God. And here is Jacob. He's thinking, I don't deserve anything. You're right. I am worthy of nothing. You're right. But God says, I'm not done with you. Hallelujah. And the same with you here tonight. God wants to bless you. He has things to still do in and of and through you if we will just trust in the Lord and lean not on our own understanding. You see, he wants to bless. Verse 14 says this now. He says this to him. Your descendants, Jacob, your descendants shall also be like the dust of the earth. And you shall spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. He now repeats the Abrahamic covenant to him and says, Look, it's because of my plan, not because of your worth, but because of my plan and my purposes. Verse 14, and behold, verse 14, 15, excuse me, and behold, I am with you. And I will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Four things to jot down right here in verse 15. We need to see. 
Four things that God has done. The first thing that God does here is he gives Jacob his presence. His presence. He says, I am with you. We need to know these four things in our lives tonight. He comes to this man who is so, quote, undeserving by the world's standards, but not in a dad who loves him, and that is God. The first thing he says is, my presence, I will be with you. The Bible says he was with us and he will never leave us nor forsake us. Amen? First thing he gives is his presence. Secondly, he offered his protection. He says, I will keep you wherever you go. If you're in an alley, if you're out doing mission works, I will keep you. I will watch over you. And if your life is called upon, it is because I decided so and I brought you home to glory to my, so that you might be blessed with me. Amen. If I live tonight, I win. If I die tonight, I win. Understand that, church. First thing is his presence. The second is his protection. Third thing God offers Jacob is his preservation. He says, I will bring you back to this land. Where you are now, this promise, I'm going to bring you back. Oh, you're going out. You've got things you need to do. God has plans for you and I, but you know what? Not all of them are going to be achieved right away. God's timing is perfect. Some of you are saying, God, you said this, but how come it hasn't happened? Because it no stay time yet. <laughs> Period. Oh, but... There's no good-looking Christian men left. I'll just have to take this guy's offer. I'll see you in counseling. (laughs) Or you wait for God's perfect timing. Amen? (laughs) Kaden. His presence... His protection, his preservation, and finally, I love what God gives him. I love this. He gives him his promise. Write that down, his promise. He says, I promise you. This isn't your granddaddy's. This isn't your daddy's. This is my promise to you. And dear one, tonight, God wants to give you these same things. He says to you, um, presence, I am with you. He says to you, protection, I will watch over you. He says, preservation, I will bring about my plan in your life. Just wait upon me. Let my timing be perfect because this is my promise to you. Tonight, it's going to be when we're worshiping, when we're singing, will you submit yourself and believe in the promises of God? Our problem is, is that too many people have lied to us. Too many people have let us down. If you haven't written this down before, I encourage you to do so, and that is this. The person behind the promise is the power. The person behind the promise is the power. Oh, we've got a government that promises all kinds of things. Oh, we'll get this done in this amount of time when it only costs this much money. When taxpayers want to stop it. Okay? The person behind the promise. When God says, I'll be there, he will be there. Let's believe him. Amen? When he says, you are forgiven, you are forgiven. When he says, I love you, I love you. When he says, I have plans to prosper you, that's his promise to you. John 14, 18 says this, I will not leave you as orphans, but I will come to you. We just need to know that tonight. God says, I will not leave you as orphans. I'm going to come to you. Now, he has this amazing dream. God is saying, there's no place you can go that I will not be with you and bless you. And verse 16 says this, Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I didn't know it. Now, why did he not know it? Well, because first of all, his circumstances. He's in a rocky situation right now, okay? He's not where he needs to be. Some of you tonight might feel that you're kind of stuck in a rocky situation. You're in a rocky marriage. You're in a rocky financial situation. You're on a rocky road. And I'm not talking about the ice cream. You're finding yourselves in this situation. But listen, in the same way that he said to him, God will say to you tonight, I am with you in this place. What place? That rocky marriage, that rocky financial situation, that rocky road. I am with you. I am, my ladder can stretch to where you at. I am with you, even though you may not know it. Jacob did not know it. You may not know it. But God is saying, I am here and I'm with you. The Lord is in this place, he says, and I didn't know it. Why did he not know it? Well, I believe that's because Jacob was not yet born again. Well, actually, born again is a New Testament term. Correct. But Jacob had been in the family that knew of God. But we see by Jacob's actions, he is not yet a man who has surrendered his life to the Lord. And so he was not in tune with the spiritual things. When you're walking in the Spirit, you will acknowledge the Spirit. You will recognize the working of the Spirit. Anyone know what I'm talking about? You get off and you know that God is doing something in the area because you're walking in and of and through the power of the Holy Spirit. He was not in tune with the Spirit yet. He didn't know it. Verse 17, he says this, And I was afraid. He said, 
He was afraid and said, how awesome. Some of you that are King James Version, how dreadful is this place. This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. He's had his first now personal encounter with God. And it causes him to rattle a little bit. It shakes his cage a little bit. He's like dreadful or awesome. The meaning it was overwhelming. Now here's the thing. Your response to a cop all depends on what you're doing and what stature you're in right now. If you're feeling a little afraid in that alley and you see an officer, you're like, oh, thank you, Jesus. If you're driving a little fast and there's a blue car behind you, you're not saying, oh, thank you, Jesus. You're saying, oh, disappear me, Jesus. Please. Drive right on by. I tithe this week. Please, God, let him go right by. I have no money for a ticket. The same man, the same position, the same authority, whether you're living right or whether you're in wrong, depends on your response. Are you with me? So often people see God as a cosmic cop, as this cosmic killjoy with his holy radar gun ready to bust you. Well, the only reason why you have this attitude is because you're not yet walking in the Spirit, and so his presence causes fear. And you say, I don't want to go to church, but I don't want to make you feel bad kind of like that. They always tell you, stop and see, and you're going to hell. Well, only those that don't have their forgiveness of Jesus going to hell. So they'll go to hell and receive Jesus tonight. <laughs> it's that simple. You see, it's where our standing is causes the reaction. So he has a fear, but there is a second kind of fear that we need to recognize. There is an afraid that we need to recognize. You see, Jacob now begins to change in his presence with God because he is now beginning to have a fear before the Lord, not just a fear of the Lord. At first it was a fear of, but now it's a fear before because you're recognizing he's holy. And that's why he says, this is Bethel. What does Bethel mean? The house of God. This is God's gate. This is where God is doing something. God is speaking to me here. The beautiful thing is Bethel is not a place. It's a position. You want to know what Bethel is? Right here. That's Bethel. That's the house of God. God will always respond to a humble heart wherever you are. Amen? Wherever you are. Do you have to go on your knees? No. But you know what? Something about being on your knees does really bring us to a point of humility. Can you jog and pray? Certainly. But I find that when I am on my knees and sometimes flat out on my face, there's something that recognizes that the Lord, He is God not me. I am not giving him my suggestion list. I'm crying out for more of him. And here we see a man struck in humility, recognizing at the lowest point of his life that God loves him. Verse 18, so Jacob arose. I love that. Jacob rose early in the morning, first thing, and took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on its top. He does what to it? He anoints it. Now, is he worshiping the rock? No. Too often we do that. We worship the church where we got saved, the pastor who brought the news. We, we elevate these things, and that's not what's going on here. What's going on here is a custom we will find throughout the Israelites' history, and that is a thing called standing stones. He sets up this stone as a memorial. A memorial is different than an altar. An altar is where you came and worshiped at. A memorial says, I had a God encounter here. You know what, folks? I want to encourage you to have a shelf somewhere in your house where you got rocks. People come in, why do you have rocks? Like, all over here. I got like a drawer full of rocks. <laughs> why right now in a drawer? Because I haven't finished my office yet, because I'm still two and a half years into my six-month plan. But nonetheless, <laughs> once I get that shelf done, these rocks will come back out. But on these rocks are written the scriptures or the moments of things where God has touched and spoken to me. And I look back at these rocks and go, yes, Lord, I remember you were faithful here. Oh, yes, God, I remember when I was praying for this and you provided here. Lord, you showed up miraculously. And each of these things let me know that my God is faithful, that my God is true, that my God is large and... And so it reminds me, and that comes from here. Do you have things that remind you, or do you only look at the present power of your pain? Or can you look back and see the past power of your God? And I look to it, and I see that, and I say, Thank you, Jesus. You will take us through, whether it's kakaako, whether we're going to be out and it's going to rain next week. I don't know. We might all be cozy under here. But we're going to do it, and we're going to go wherever God calls us to go. And whatever he's going to do on Sunday, listen, we're at that point right now where we're going to have to start doing that to service. 
And we're working on all the details and how that goes. We can't do a Saturday night because we don't have the building on Saturday night. They do plays and they do things and so on and so forth. How is that going to work? Many hands makes. And we're just going to watch what God's going to do and we'll be giving you more information as we walk through that. But, you know, the parking lot I understand right now is quite a difficult thing. And we want to make it easy for anyone to come and hear the gospel of Jesus. So it's going to be a little inconvenient for us here. So what? I'm here to serve until he calls me home. Amen? Everyone says, are you going to be able to preach two services back to back? Yes. (laughs) I'll have to change my shirt, but still, we'll be able to do it because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So, why do we set these stones up? To remind us, but here also jot this down, that others might ask. That others might ask. What do these stones mean? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you. You see, I believe, guys, I believe if you're taking notes, this is the first fruit, the first fruit of Jacob becoming a believer. This is the first fruit. This is God's door. He has spoken to me. He sets up a standing stone and says, God met me here. Where did God meet you? Do you know that place? Do you recognize that place? Do you praise God for that moment? You see, the heart of a true believer is always looking for a way to express their love and thanksgiving to God. Can I say that again? The heart of a true believer is always looking for a place and a way to say thanksgiving and express their love to God. And that is what we see Jacob doing. Now, as we go on here, verse 19. After he sets up the stone and pours oil upon it, meaning the anointing that God, this was a holy place, he called the name of the place Bethel, as I said, house of God. Beth is house, El, for God. However, previously the name of the place had been Luz. Now, I just want to make fun of the English exp- pronunciation of it. Tonight you're either in Bethel, the house of God, or what? Luz. Think about it. Okay, anyways, moving on. (laughs) Then Jacob made a vow saying, and we've got to clear this up for us. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me on this journey that I take and will give me food and eat and garments to wear and I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. Now, when we read this in our language and we read this in the English and we don't understand the personal pronouns that are before it, it sure sounds like a conditional prayer, doesn't it? If God does this and He does do all these things that He said, then He'll be my God. Sadly enough, I have met people whom that was their decision to God as well. They heard a teacher like me talking about the goodness and the greatness and the kindness of God. And they said, well, why not? I tried drugs. I tried alcohol. I tried money. I'll try God. Listen, if you're hearing that message from me tonight, that's not what I'm sharing. God is not something you try. He's someone we surrender to. He is God and He is holy. And though He slay me, I will praise Him. God has the right to use my life to bring glory and honor because He's given me more than I deserve and that is life, love, and eternity. And I don't deserve any of those, but He has given those to me freely, but it cost Him a lot. It cost Him Himself. He died on a cross. He had to buy me back from sin. That's not what Jacob is saying here. Now, how can I explain that to you? Well, when you read it in the Hebrew, it would be a whole lot easier if you put the word since. Instead of the word if, put the word since God will be with me and keep me on this journey that I take and give me food to eat and garments to wear and I return to my father's house in safety. Though the Lord, he is my God. What is he saying? Really what he's saying, if you understand the context of he's saying, Lord, if you will have me, this is amazing. If, if, if you're going to do all these things, you're going to do all this stuff wow that's where he's at when's the last time you were wowed by God well I'll tell you the answer to that is the last time you journaled the things that God wants to bless you and the promises of God when's the last time you sat down and did a biography uh, listed off just the attributes of God do you have a place somewhere where you can just list off all the things of God you know, ask me what kind of Harley I have. I can tell you everything about it. Year, make, size, model, paint color, motor car. All, blah, 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 blah. Tell me about your God. He's good. He's large and in charge. He's love. And you see, seeing the blessings, the promises, the power of God, he's like, whoa, Lord, if you'll have me, amazing. Lord, if you want to do all this stuff, I'm done blocking what you want to give to me tonight. I don't know who you are tonight, but that's for you. 
you need to be hearing this and saying, Lord, if you want to do what all this, that guy up there is saying, if you want to do that, Lord, I'm done fighting. I'm done rebelling. I'm done giving even you and my mom and everyone else excuses and why you can't love me and why I can't be worthy of all the things. I, if this is what you want to do, here I am, Lord. Here I am. Verse 22. And the stone which I have set as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that thou dost give me, I will surely give a tenth to thee. You see, folks, I know that Jacob was converted at this moment of this place in this time because of this moment. True conversion is seen not in one's words, but in their works. True conversion is not seen in one's words, but in their works. The Bible says faith without works is Now, I offer every single Wednesday, I offer every single Sunday, and I will always offer a chance for someone to surrender their life to Jesus Christ. Why do I do that? Because I want none to walk away and miss the everlasting. I don't know your last breath, and neither do you. But I have sometimes my elders and some of the other pastors saying, you know, once they raise their hand, you've got to get them to stand up. And then once you get them to stand up, you've got to get them to walk off to the side because not always do people come forward. And my point is, that don't matter. You standing before Jesus. I'm giving you the opportunity. And if you just want to respond, that's fine. But if you are totally surrendered to the Lord, you will get off your hiney. You will come to where the prayer people are and you will say, here am I. I surrender my life to Jesus. What do I need to know? When Dave Blevins gave his life to the Lord, I didn't have to have him repeat after me a prayer. Dear Jesus, dear Jesus. There was no mama. This was a man on his knees, weeping, convulsing uncontrollably. God broke the anger, the meanness, the alcoholism. He was at my feet. I think that's the first time that guy had ever been at a white guy's feet. (laughs) But God changed his life. And that's what we see here. How do I know this? He says, whatever you give me, Lord, you want to do all this? Amazing. If you do, Listen, whatever you give me, Lord, I'm giving you a tenth. It's called a tithe here, folks. Every Christian should understand that the first tenth of whatever we have is God's. And if I keep that tenth, then I'm robbing God. That's what it says in Malachi. You robbed God. How do we rob you? By holding out your tithe. But God says, if you let it go, if you bring that tithe in, He says, what? I will open the windows of heaven and bless you. That's a pretty good blessing. I suggest we don't miss. Now, someone's sitting out there going, How did we get to a tithing sermon? (laughs) Here they go again. (laughs) Number one, it's in the book. It's in the passage. I didn't bring it up. God did. But here's something you need to know. You need to jot this down. God has a job to do. You know what that job that God has? Not only first to redeem us, after to redeem us. You know what God's is? God's other plan is he needs to make you and I less selfish. God is de-selfishizing us. Hey, I grew up here. We can make our own words. English is limited. He is deselfishizing us. The Lord needs to make us less, self- less selfish. So listen. So he, he requires of you and I the first tenth of everything we have. Why? Because every time we put our tithe in the box, along with it goes a little bit of my selfishness. And every time I get, Lord, you gave me a hundred bucks, that ten, I mean, it's all yours. Tithing is not how much of my money I give to God. It's how much of God's money I keep. So I don't even deserve what I got because even the eyes to see and the ears and the car to get to work, you blessed me with all of that. So here, you gave me a hundred dollars, ten of it is yours. And Lord, and when I do that, it is a faith saying, God, I believe you can do more with 90 than I can with a hundred because I'm born again. I trust you. I recognize the ladder that says I will provide for you and I will bring you into this land. You will give me your presence. You will give me your protection. You will give me your provision. You will give me your promise. And so Lord, it doesn't matter. Here, I will surrender to you and I will let go my selfishness, my need to make myself greater or my need to trust in myself I'm going to trust in God that's tithing church and isn't it amazing how Satan has taken that and so twisted it and made people think so uh, and made it such an ugly thing and what was so intended to be a beautiful thing in an act of worship so much so when you bring it up people are like oh, 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 oh. God knows what's best for us I say we trust in the Lord amen and lean not on our own understanding alright we're done with this chapter so let me ask you this question What can separate us from the love of God? Nothing. 
Take your Bibles right now and go to Romans 8 and we're done. Go to Romans 8. In Romans 8, the very last two verses say what in Romans 8? Take a look at it there. In Romans 8, I just asked, what can separate us from the love of God? He says, for I am convinced, that's a pretty strong word. I am convinced, convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depth, nor any other created thing. That includes me, you got to write in there. Nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here is Jacob a scoundrel. His name literally means scoundrel. It means heel grabber, supplanter. And here he has scoundreled his whole life from a bowl of soup to putting on false clothes, being someone who he is not. Oh, that preached to somebody. And being someone that he is not, he is sought to deceive by gain his entire life by dishonesty. By dishonesty, she has represented something she is not. And here he finds himself in the lone recognizing that he has been three to four different people. And so for that reason, he's so shallow that he doesn't even know, she doesn't even know who she is anymore. And God says, I know who you are. And he builds a ladder. He says, no place, nowhere are you too far from me. And I want to give you my presence. I want to give you my provision. I want to give you my protection. I want to give you my promise. I want to give you myself. That's what he offers What is able to separate us from the love of God? Nothing. Why? You need to know this. Why? Because there is no condemnation. What? Go now to the first verse in Romans 8. The last verse says, nothing has separated us from the love of God. Why? Because the book ends, finish the rest of the story. Romans 8, 1. There is now no condemnation for those who are what? In Christ. Folks, there is no separation because there is no condemnation. There is no separation because there is no condemnation. Can you get an amen on that? Okay, so look at me, please. There is a ladder that goes from heaven to earth. And that ladder today looks more like a cross. The cross is God's ladder. It's the bridge that says there's nothing that you've done that is beyond my love for you. There is nothing. There is no separation because there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. The question tonight is, are you in Christ? Not if you prayed a prayer to ask Jesus into your life. I'm not asking that. A lot of us have recognized you've done that two or three, four times and there's still been no change. It's because you asked Jesus into your life and you're taking him all over the places where God doesn't want you to be. That's not what God is asking tonight. He's not asking, do you want me to come in? No, no, no. There's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Christ. 